Santa went this way and I went that way. <clears throat> no, we're in good, we're good friends. <laughs> if you have your Bible, turn to the book of Judges, chapter 82 tonight, please. Judges chapter 82, verse 1. God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods. How long will you judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked, Selah? Defend the poor and the fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy, rid them out of the hand of the wicked. They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. Now, I'll call your attention, look very carefully at what we're about to read. I have said you're gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. But ye shall die like men, and fall like one of the princes. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for thou shalt inherit all nations. Father, bless this holy word now. In thy name I pray. Amen. In the book of Job, we read about the sons of God came before uh, the Lord, appeared before him. And, of course, uh, we have uh, Job 38, when God created physical creation. Then, In the first chapter of Job, we find Satan walking to and fro in the presence of God as he holds some sort of a judgment or council meeting. We also read about Ahab, how that the angels appeared before Ahab, spirits did, and God said, who will go forth and lie or who will be a lying spirit? And this one, uh, this one spirit said, I will. And he went forth and sent forth from the presence of God. We read the book of Daniel, how that when Daniel prayed in Daniel 9, that God had sent the answer, but it took 21 days to get there because the prince of Persia had withstood this messenger on his way. The reason I mention these things because they have to do with the spirit world that's not obvious to our minds. The spirit world that surely exists tonight just as surely as we live. No question about it. We understand by looking at the, uh, at the king, the queen, the president, the prime minister, all the leaders of the earth, we realize that uh, they are human and they are human beings, but they're not the final answer. For the most part, they're pawns in the hands of a higher power. The Bible said in Ephesians 1, he worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. And you've got to keep in mind, makes no difference what happens, when it happens, to whom it happens. God is still God yes, and nothing changes. Nothing has changed, nothing will change when it comes to that. The book of Psalm, chapter number 82, is quoted by the Lord Jesus Christ. He quotes it to these, uh, to these uh, Pharisees. And he quotes it to them because they had challenged his authority. And, of course, they challenged his authority on more than one occasion. And, of course, they accused him of being a son of Belial. They accused him of being a Samaritan. They accused him of being demon-possessed. They accused him of being illegitimate. Anything else they could drag up against him, they accused him of. Anything to tear him down, to try to lift themselves up. And that you would do well to leave the Lord Jesus alone. If you've got problems uh, with people, that's one thing. But if you, if you turn on the Son of God, then you, you can get in trouble. But what he says here in Psalm chapter number 82 is this. To these gods, in verse number 6, he said, I've said ye are gods. Gods. Now, in the Old Testament, the sons of God saw the daughters of men, Genesis 6. These are angels. The Bible says in Job 38, the sons of God shouted for joy when God created. These are angels. The Bible tells you in the book of Luke, chapter number 2, that when Adam was made, he was the son of God. We read where God speaks of Israel in a corporate sense, as ye are my sons and my daughters, saith the Lord. So therefore, son of God, or the term son of God, has a reference to a lot of different things. We today, in this house, if you're born of the Spirit of God, you are a son of God by the new birth. You've been born of the Spirit of God. Now here in Psalm chapter number 82, that's not who he's talking about. Here in Psalm 82, he's talking about people that have been given authority over over principalities or powers that he talks about in the New Testament. Powers, principalities. I've often wondered here in 2022, about to go into 2023, uh, who runs America? 
You ever wondered? You ever wondered? Because there was a time, no doubt, America was uh, at least in at least in in, in intent uh, was trying to be a Christian nation or follow the the Ten Commandments and morality. Uh, but how many how many of you have ever heard of RuPaul? Drag race. You heard of that? All right, that's being that's being promoted now on television, and uh, you, you're getting a sense now of the moral debauchery in this country. This is what's happening. This is where America is headed. I uh, would like to see America turn around. But I'm going to tell you something. The Church of God doesn't have to go there. Amen. They may, but we don't have to. Amen. Keep your sanity. It doesn't make any difference what this crowd out here calls right or wrong, good or bad. That's irrelevant. That means nothing. What does the Bible say? And what does the Spirit of God witness to in your heart? So here in Psalm chapter number 82, he said in verse number 6, I've said to your gods and all of you children of the Most High. Now watch this. But ye shall die like men. Now there are those who try to make these gods men. They're not men. They're gods. They're spirit beings. They are, uh, for all intentions, the, like we read about in the book of Daniel, overseers over a country, over an area, over a region. And uh, if you'll notice that they've been they're commissioned with, with watching people, watching over people in the first two or three verses here of uh, Psalm 82. But they turned and they fell away from what they should have been doing. And so here's, we have, an, we have a warning. God says you'll die like men. That's quite a thing for an angel to tell an angel that it will die like a man because an angel's spirit being and they're spirit beings, folks. They're not physical beings. They're spirit. They can take on a physical structure. They can appear as men. Be careful you don't entertain angel unaware, but what you have here are spirit beings. Now, in the book of Ephesians, chapter number 4, in verses 7 through 12, the Bible said, Unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, When he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now, watch the next verse. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? The Bible is very clear on this that this lower parts of the earth has to do with the center of the earth. It has to do with something that's down there below our feet. And it is a real place. And according to what happens here in Ephesians chapter number 4, the Lord Jesus Christ, when he ascended to heaven, he took out of that place those that belonged to him. And that's what we're talking about here. But it says in verse 10, He that descended is the same also that ascended far above all heavens that he might fill all things. And then once he ascended above them, principalities, powers, spiritual wickedness and rulers and darkness and all of that, then he gave gifts and he sent these people back. And like the word sent, you remember what I told you that word sent means. Apostolos, is the Greek word for it. An apostle is a sent one. That means he has a commission, he has authority, and he has an anointing to go with it. And so the Bible says he descended, same also ascended, far above that he might fill all things. Then he gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying, the body of Christ. The Bible sets the church of God always apart from the world, the rulers of this world, the spiritual wickedness in high places. We're not part of it. And this is what's important to understand. This is his body that meets in here tonight. Yes, and he loves his body, his bride. And that's who we are. Now, if you read in Luke chapter 16, verse number 26, it says, And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Luke 16. Who's talking here? Look at the text and read it. Who? Abraham. Avraham. It's called Abraham's bosom. But it's in the heart of the earth. And this has to do with that leading captivity captive, giving gifts to men. You see, once he led them forth, then he sent them forth. And we tonight need that power. We need that authority. As I mentioned to you a moment ago, when you, have, when you have a drag race coming on this country, they're grooming your children. They want your little children. This is why they read to them in these, uh, in these libraries. 
used to be places of learning. They're not places of learning anymore. They're places of indoctrination. Your children do not belong to the government. And they sure don't belong to the drag race. Amen. They're a heritage of the Lord, folks. They've been lent to you from the hand of the Lord. The Bible said in the book of Revelation, chapter number 9 and verse 1, the fifth angel sounded. And I saw a star fall from heaven to the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. This is another reference to the heart of the earth. The bottomless pit. But the thing in Revelation chapter number 9 is that it opens up. It physically opens. It's like over there when, when Korah, Datham, and Byron had rebelled against Moses. And God did a new thing, it says. And he opened up the earth. And he swallowed them alive into it. That's a horrible scene, can't you imagine? But this is what's happening here. In other words, all the stops have been pulled. All, everything that up until this point that, uh, that was standard is no longer standard. We're living in an upside down spiritual religious situation. We really are. Remember I told you that over half the people that go to church is hooked on pornography. Probably 20 to 30% of the reverends in the pulpit are hooked on pornography. And the vast majority of the people that go to the church house voted to keep Democrats in office or whoever else they felt like would, give, would keep them with the abortion rights. You know, they call them rights. You talk about a fabricated word, that is one. Yes, sir. Right. Who gave them the right to kill a baby? They say it so much, though people start buying into it and believing it's real. Believing it has validity. It had no validity. That's a man-made piece of garbage. You don't have a right to kill your baby. But in any event, in any event, the church house is full of people who are of this world. They love not the truth. They took pleasure in unrighteousness. And for this cause, God's going to send them strong delusion. They may be damned. Believe not. Second Thessalonians 2. That's a sad thing. Don't be caught up with it. Don't be part of that. We're not talking about the Baptist or the Methodist, the Presbyterian, the rest of them. We're talking about people who claim to be Christians. There should be something common among all Christians. There should be a spirit among all of us. We may differ on some points of eschatology. We may be differ on this and that and so forth. But there are things that we do not differ on. Yes, sir. And so the key to the bottomless pit, he opened the pit. And when he opened that pit, something comes out of it. I think things are coming out right now. Yes, I don't know that it's coming from this bottomless pit yet. But stuff's coming. It's demonic. You're watching a demonic world. I've lived long enough to where I can tell the difference between the two. Demonic does some, sometimes makes no sense. You just feel a wickedness. A wickedness. Now the Bible says in the book of 1 Peter chapter number 3 verse 18, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. Now look how it says this. Being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Do you remember what I said? It is an utter impossibility for God to die. That cannot happen. That cannot happen for God to die. If God died, who would raise God from the dead? If God died, he wouldn't have eternal life. Now, I wouldn't say, I'll take that back. He doesn't have eternal life. He is eternal life. <laughs> God cannot die. But now notice the way the Lord through Peter says this. Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh. See how specific that is? He didn't say he was put to death in the spirit, and he didn't say that his soul was put to death. But it says that his flesh, but he was quickened by the spirit. The Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, raised up Christ from the dead. Well, you say, wait a minute, I thought Christ, yes, he did. I thought the Father did, yes, he did. <laughs> you see, this is the problem. The Trinity is inseparable. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost make up one God, just one. And sometimes they work so closely together that you cannot tell the difference. So he says to them in verse number 19, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. Notice the spirits, they're in prison, and he's preaching to them. Which sometime were disobedient. Now notice he locates these people. This is important. 
which sometime were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. Now, why in the world would he do that? Well, that's a study I'd take apart with you, and we could go into it and study that. It's, it's very impressive. It's a very important thing to understand. But just get this part. He went to the heart of the earth. And going to the heart of the earth, he had a ministry. And that one of the things of that ministry was to preach, to announce to the spirits in prison. And the spirits that were in prison were the spirits that lived in the days of Noah. In the days of Noah, the Bible said men began to multiply on the earth. There was only eight souls saved. So that means that only eight souls were saved out of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions probably, no doubt. If you notice now carefully, this is a place that you can go down into and you can come back out of. Here's what, uh, here's what Peter said on the day of Pentecost. Acts chapter number 2 and verse 26. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope. Now watch this. Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Now let me tell you something tonight. I do not believe for one moment that the Lord Jesus Christ went over to the place that the rich man lifted up his eyes in hell. Where'd he go? He went to Abraham's bosom. Well, it's called hell. The word hell is a translation of two Greek words for the most part. In the Old Testament, Sheol is the unseen state of the dead. All right? That was Abraham's bosom. New Testament, it's Hades. All right? They both have referred to the same place. Now, it's not just a place of suffering, but it's also a place where he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. In other words, it's got a compartment. You remember in Luke chapter number 16 when the rich man died and was buried, and then Lazarus was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Notice that Lazarus was not carried into heaven. He was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Then they begin to communicate. And the rich man was told by Abraham that there's a great gulf between the two of us. Well, they were essentially in the same region, but there was a gulf separating the two of them. Now, how, lo how wide that gulf was, it's, I have no idea, but it's really not important. The bottom line is that there was a separation made. And that separation was there at the time of Christ. And when he died on the cross, his body died Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. His spirit went into the presence of the Almighty. His soul descended into the heart of the earth. Now, there's a lot of things going on with this, and I won't get into all that tonight because we want to spend a little time with a few of the things. But don't you think about what might have happened had he, uh, had he encountered some, uh, some opposition while he was there. Imagine, there are those who teach that the Lord Jesus Christ paid for your sin debt partially at the cross and finished paying for it in hell. That's abomination. Yes, Say why? Because he takes away from the finished work that Christ himself said it is finished. When he said it is finished, he meant it's finished. It can't be added to, can't be embellished, can't be made better. It's finished. There's nothing you can do to add to what he did. That means that there is nothing he could have done in hell in other words, in Sheol or in, in, in uh, Hades, that would have made a difference as far as your sins are concerned. That was done at Calvary by the blood covenant of the Lord Jesus. Yes. And there we have a peace with God. So the Bible says here in the book of Acts chapter number 2 and verse 27, Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. Now in John chapter number 2 and verse 19, the scripture says, Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple. Note carefully now. Now he's using a comparative thing because you had Herod's temple that had taken decades to come to the point it was when he was here. As they tell us, the historians tell us, it wasn't even finished then, that they worked on for more decades afterwards. Some, took something like 80, 90 years to get it in a completed form. Bottom line is probably... <laughs> Probably just about the time they finished it, Titus came in and tore it down. Because <laughs> the Lord said, not one stone be left upon another in this thing. And it wasn't. If God said it, that's the way it was. But in chapter number 2 of the Gospel of John, in verse number 19, he said unto them, destroy this temple. And in three days, 
I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building. Now, who did, who did this? Who built this temple? Herod. Herod, which one? The, the Idumean usurper sitting on the throne of David. Herod the Great. All right. Herod the Great, the murderer of the two-year-olds. You remember him? All right. He said, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up, said the Jews. Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? See their thinking? Nicodemus, you must be born again. You remember that? Nicodemus says, how can a man enter his mother's womb the second time and be born? You see, the Lord Jesus was teaching him a truth that's higher than the physical understanding of it. All right. Nicodemus, you've got to be born again. That which is born of the flesh, that's how you're here. You're born of the flesh, but then that which is born of the spirit. You've got a temple standing here that took 46 years to get to this point. But let me talk to you about a greater temple, an infinitely greater temple. And here's what he said to them. He said, uh, but he, forty and six years, the temple, wilt thou rear it in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. Okay? The temple of his body. Notice how now the Bible is starting to, to, to identify and define the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, separate from him. See what I mean? For three days, his body lay in the tomb, and he wasn't in it. That body lay there. His body did not see corruption for three days in the tomb. Now, don't you think about this tonight. You remember I told you that God the Father was the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, right? Okay. Was the Lord Jesus Christ a sinless man? Of course he was. But he was born of a woman. Okay. So what are you saying, preacher? Well, I'm saying if he got any sin, he didn't get it from his mother. And of course he didn't, right? In other words, the mother did not pass any sin on to her son. Yeah. You know, it says in Romans chapter number five, for as by one woman, death entered the world and death by sin for death passed upon all men. That's not what it says, is it? What's it say? For by one what? Man. For by one man, sin entered into the world. Are you saying then, preacher, that a woman has a special plea? Yeah, I am. I'm saying the curse does not come through your mother. The curse comes through your father. That's where it comes through. Just like they tell us now that uh, for the most part, most of your, uh, your gender identity comes from your father. And it's probably to be found in that Y chromosome. Because the man, of course, has XY and the woman has XX. Y'all look that up sometimes. It's an interesting thing to look at those chromosomes. They start small, they get bigger, and you can look at the, look at the, look at the fashion the, uh, of them, and then when you get to the XY, it's just as plain as it can be. But of course, that's the sex chromosome, and of course, we're talking about a man, not a woman. You say, you got me thinking, preacher, good. I am glad I have. I'm glad I have. <laughs> if I've accomplished something, if I've done that. I mean, that's the kind of thing I toss and turn at 2 o'clock in the morning, looking up the seat, and I'm thinking, man, why the, how come the woman's left out of this? Because God didn't give the command of death to the woman. He gave it to the man. The command was already given to the man before the woman was ever made. And the woman was not, the man was made for God. The woman was not made for God. The woman was made for the man. That's right. That's what it says. He said to, he said to Eve, your desire shall be unto your husband. And, of course, that's a whole lot different thing. And I probably got the uh, feminist mad at me tonight, but that's okay. They've been, I guarantee you they've been mad at me before I got up here tonight. So you can believe that. <laughs> Say anything new. But doesn't that make you think? I mean, just a little thing like that. Just think about that for a moment. That makes you think, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. For as by one man, sin entered into the world. So the Bible says here that his temple... He spake of the temple of his body. All right. Now, the uh, Colossians chapter number 2 and verse number 11 says this. In whom also you're circumcised, with the circumcision made without hands, and the putting off the body of the sins of the flesh. Isn't that strange? So what's that mean? Well, that's a spiritual circumcision that takes place. 
Oh, what's a circumcision? It's the cutting of the flesh. The reason the, the original circumcision took place because God said there's something wrong with your seed, Abraham. It's not the seed of the woman, folks. It's the seed of the man. Yes. Well, the Bible talks about the seed of the woman. Yes, but that was a seed given to the woman. It did not originate with her. You see, the seed is an issue. Man had a problem in the Old Testament, and he couldn't do anything to change it. And year after year after year after year, all he could do was push forward his sins. God would forgive them, but he couldn't cleanse them, purge them, and do away with them. Why? Because he had to have a blood covenant to justify himself for allowing it to come into the world. Yes, sir. The issue was not justifying man near as it was, justifying God himself. That he is just and the justifier of them that believe on Jesus. Yes, sir. Think on that. That's important. So now today, there's a difference in us. This is why he said, Nicodemus, you must be born again born again. Are you saying then, preacher, the Old Testament saints were not born again? No, they weren't. No, they weren't. No, they weren't. The only way that anybody can be born again is to be born of the Spirit of the living God under the new covenant, and that covenant was not ratified till Christ died, Hebrews 9. Without the death of the testator, the testament is not in force. Now, once you are born again, that puts you in a special class. Because body, soul, and spirit now has been set apart. You are absolutely different from any of them. You remember David said, Lord, take not thine Holy Ghost from me. Remember he said that? And he, he was fearful that God would. Why? Because he had not been baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. He had not been sealed by the Spirit of the living God. Sealing means to secure and sealing means to mark. Hadn't happened. Hadn't happened and couldn't happen. Until the Lord Jesus Christ, by his blood covenant, blood sacrifice, made it possible for us to shed this old body of death. And so David, and so, and so the Apostle Paul says, O wretched man that I am. Romans 7, you remember that? O wretched man that I am. I looked at that the other day and I thought, there's only one other place in the New Testament where that word wretched is used. You know where it is? The church of Laodicea, remember them? That thou art miserable, wretched, naked, and blind. But here's what he said about the church of Laodicea. He said, thou knowest not that thou art wretched. Okay? But Paul said, I know I'm wretched. See the comparison? See the difference? See the two? All right? And so therefore Paul said in Romans 7, I know that in my flesh... This is part of him, dwelleth no good thing. So with the flesh, I serve the law of sin, but with the mind, my spirit, my soul, I serve the law of Christ. Then the eighth chapter of Romans, he starts by saying, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. All right? For the Bible says the spirit of, the, of, the, of, the spirit of liberty in Christ has made us free from the, from, from the law of sin and death chopped up that pretty bad, but that's what it essentially says in Romans 8. So let's go back and look at it for a moment. He says in Colossians 2, in whom also you're circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Now some folks spiritualize that. Well, I'm going to tell you something. I believe it's real. I believe it's something that happens. And the putting off the sins of the flesh. Now in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, the Apostle Paul gives them a eulogy blessing. And here's what he says. The very God of peace sanctify you wholly. I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus. There we are. Spirit, soul, and body. Spirit is born again. Soul is saved. Body is... The uh, best thing to say for the body is that it's... Uh, it's, uh, it's purchase, purchase possession, Romans 8, waiting for the purchase possession. Keep my body, bring it into subjection. You never look to the body for inspiration or, or obedience. You take command over it. That's the only thing, the best you can do with the body. At, at, that's, that's it. The body, the body will never, on its own, ever want to serve Christ. 
It's, uh, it's an enemy. The Bible said the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary one to another and they cannot do the things that they would. Are you following me tonight? Spirit, soul, and body. Now here's what the Lord told them in the book of Matthew chapter 10 verse 28. Fear not them which kill the body. See that? Matthew 10, 28. Fear not them which kill the body. Well, most, most, most anybody can kill your body. All right? I mean, man's really good at it, if you don't know the truth about the matter. I mean, he's proficient. He's become an expert at killing. Huh? He can kill by the tens and hundreds of thousands. Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But fear, rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Now, folks, don't play with it. Don't play with hell. It's a real place, and you don't want to go there. It's a, real, it's a reality that most people would shock them to death if they thought for a moment. But he said this, him that is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. In Revelation chapter number 6, when we come down to the, uh, the, uh, the tribulation period, time of Jacob's trouble, it says this, Revelation 6, 9. When he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Notice where the souls are now. They're under the altar. You know, I've told you about the French Revolution many times. And uh, they, got, they got rid of uh, Louis the Sixteenth and Marie Antoinette. Went into a republic. I think France now is in about its fifth or sixth republic. I mean, they've been going through some change after change after change. And uh, the point was that they wanted to overthrow the powers that be, and the people wanted to rule the people. And so the guillotine became the weapon of choice. And uh, Maximilian Robespierre was one of the big heads, one of the big leaders in it. And he was responsible for the decapitation of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Frenchmen. And lo and behold, if Maximilian Robespierre didn't wind up walking up on the same scaffold, up to the same guillotine and had his head cut off. That's the way they do, folks. They consume each other. That's this woke crowd today. You watch one of them every once in a while and their conscience will smite them. They, they, they forgot they had one. <laughs> it's been so long since they'd heard it, they couldn't remember if they even had one. All of a sudden, the, the, this dead conscience, quiet, begins to speak up and bothers them. And then they say something. And lo and behold, instead of finding understanding, do you know what the woke crowd does? They turn on them. They turn on each other. So they cut their heads off. And there's, some, there's some paintings of it. It's quite a thing. A courtyard full of soldiers and people. And there they walk up on that, uh, on that scaffold to be guillotined. It may very well be that this is what happens to many, many, many of the saints of God in tribulation period, yes, tribulation saints. Yes, the truth of the matter is, though, the guillotine's a pretty efficient way to leave this world. I mean, there's really, you know, heads gone. Uh, the, um, the, the Latin word for head is caput. Have you ever remember that? Have you ever heard that? Caput. That's a Latin word for head. I remember when I was a kid, kaput. How many times did you ever hear that said? I doubt seriously if any of them knew that was Latin, but that's pure Latin. In other words, the head went kaput. Off it went, separated, and away it went. Well, you know, folks, we don't know what's going to happen to us, do we? But I know one thing. I'm not going to sell my soul and my spirit for a temporal world. If God decides he wants to take me, uh, you know, my life's in his hands. I love him tonight. I uh, serve him. And I know that the time is coming when uh, it'll get real bad. Now, you know, the latest figure is that there's about 1,500,000,000, maybe 700,000,000 
Christians in the world. A little less than two billion. Muslims run about the same, about 1.5, 1.7 billion Muslims in the world. And there are countries in this world, especially in Eastern Europe and places like that, where Christianity, quote unquote, still reigns. And uh, 80, 90 percent or over 90 percent of the people in the country claim to be Christians. America is not one of them. I don't know what's going to happen here. I have no idea. This is why tonight I say, even so come, Lord Jesus. Yes, sir. I'm... I'm kind of disappointed tonight. I'm not disappointed because Christmas is over. I'm disappointed because he hadn't come yet. This coming Friday, what, Saturday night, they'll be gathering around to watch the ball drop up here in, the, in the Times Square. Don't, do they have a ball here in Knoxville now? They wouldn't be left behind. Knoxville's got its own ball. <laughs> I bet Knoxville's ball is not as big as New York's ball. I bet they got a bigger ball than we have here. Well, here's the thing. They'll get together and they'll get drunk and they'll dance around out there and sing old anxiety, you know, and they'll all cry and moan, carry on, New Year's coming. Why they would embrace something that they have no idea what's going to bring into their lives is beyond me. I never could figure that one out. Why don't you embrace one who will bring something to your life? You say, what are you going to be doing when they're singing old anxiety? <laughs> <laughs> That's how important it is to me. <laughs> it means absolutely nothing. Do you know why? He told them, he said, a bib. This is the month when the bib, when the, when the, when the, when the, uh, when the, when the seed is in the, in the, in the bib, the uh, husk or whatever it is. He said, That's the beginning of time for you. And what is that? That's the Passover. And when does that take place? In the spring. And so that's what counts. That's when you start your time. It was changed to Nisan, Nisan. It was started at Abib and changed to Nisan like everything else. You take the original names given to these months that God gave to Israel, and they're all good. They're names that glorify God. And then you'll watch them as they change the name, and they start pulling in the paganism and change it to that. And it's just like Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah when they change their names. And this is what happens to them. Well, I'm going to go back to Abib. Say, so when's Abib? About March 20, 21st, 25th, April, somewhere along in there. That's Abib. Now, it's, you know, the old anxiety, drunken, ball raising crowd out here, it doesn't mean a thing to them, but it does to me. Yeah, why? Because we all have an Abib. Mine was 1973. That's when my life started. That's when it started. And do you know what? It was in the spring of the year. At the time, I didn't plan it to be that way. Had no eyes ignorant as I could be of the Bible, but just so happened that it was in the spring of the year that I got born again. Hallelujah. Father, bless your word tonight. Thank you for the good folk who've come out to hear it. Those folks that have been watching online here now and watching this thing live. They'll watch it later. And Father, we pray, Lord, tonight, somebody will get something out of this that'll help them. they go home, Father, and they'll bless you and they'll feel better about this. They'll glorify your name. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right.